Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, EESI. We're very, very glad that you're here with us this afternoon. And we look forward to um, holding this annual briefing uh, that we have been doing for a number of years. Uh, I'm sure it's like more than uh, 10 or 12 years now that we have been holding in partnership with the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. So it has always been an important uh, opportunity to have a chance to have a senior uh, Department of Energy official here to walk us through the administration's budget request uh, on energy efficiency and renewable energy so that we can all better understand what really are the key programs, why, what's being achieved, uh, so that it's always a very, very helpful um, exercise to go through so that we all learn a, a lot more about what's going on. And we are also always very glad to have Fred, to be joined by Fred Sassine from the Congressional Research Service, uh, since CRS is such an important part of how the Congress is able to really do its work in, in terms of the information and analysis that is provided to members uh, through, through that. And, and of course, our third panelist is Scott Sklar, uh, who not only is, uh, you know, has been uh, a very, very experienced and an expert in terms of uh, so much of sustainable energy and in terms of renewable energy and working on efficiency issues, but really looking holistically at energy policy. And of course, uh, while Scott is, is an adjunct at George Washington University and is doing uh, many, many different kinds of things through his own business um, uh, uh, company. At the same time, we also work very, very closely together in that he chairs the steering committee for the Sustainable Energy Coalition, which is an important piece of work that we do with the Congressional Caucus on Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. So uh, at this time, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is going to lead us through DOE's efficiency and renewable energy budget, really talk about the priorities, what, what this represents, and, and why, what the key goals are. And we are very, very glad to be joined to do this by Mike Carr, who is senior advisor and the EERE Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, at DOE for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And of course, Mike has been at DOE for a number of years, but prior to that, he also spent a number of years here on the Hill uh, on the Senate side working on energy issues. He's also been in other government agencies as well as working on energy in the private sector. So we're delighted to have Mike with us this afternoon. Thanks, Carol. Uh, appreciate having me here. Um, uh, this is actually kind of a homecoming. This was this was where I worked for eight years, uh, and uh, spent a heck of a lot of time in this in this room, usually facing that direction, uh, or sitting back there. <laughs> um, but um, but it's it's always good to come back and and uh, talk to folks here. Uh, I also wanted to recognize uh, Fred Fred Sassine, who uh, who was at CRS. You know, and very helpful back when I was when I was on the committee here, and uh, and Scott, uh, who's been a a, con a constant voice on these issues uh, for. <laughs> for <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> for for a long time. Like, see, a good consistent voice. Um, so uh, uh, I will try to try to not make this too dry a presentation. Uh, it's. You know, ERE is a very big place, and so it is a somewhat of a somewhat of a dense topic to go through our budget. Um, uh, as I think the secretary has pointed out, you know, if you if you look at our three pillars aggregated, it looks it looks like a lot, but we have ten technology programs within those three pillars, and each of those those three pillars themselves are are roughly equivalent to uh, another another pillar within the R and D programs within DOE. Um, so let me let me try to to sort of muscle through it somewhat quickly. Um, the, the the defining goal within EERE though is to uh, 
we're trying to focus on the competitive opportunity that is created by the technology suite that we work on in, across the clean energy space. And we believe there is a, a giant uh, global opportunity on that. Uh, our specific goals, you can see up here, uh, the, the administration has set some clear goals for energy efficiency and renewable energy. And uh, although we have programs that, that work on every bit of this, um, one thing that I w would like to highlight right up front is that just within uh, President Obama's second term, we've issued 12 final energy efficiency rules uh, uh, for appliances, which will save an estimated 500 million metric tons of CO2 and around $87 billion for consumers and electricity bills by 2030. Uh, so that's an example of the sort of the, the outsized impact that a lot of our work uh, can have. Uh, so in order to uh, su support the groundbreaking science and innovation that's essential for achieving the president's vision, uh, we, we support some of the best innovators in the country and businesses. Uh, these are leaders who research, develop, demonstrate, and deploy high impact, cutting edge technologies that make clean energy just as affordable and convenient as the traditional forms that we're all used to. So we break, we break our work down into three fundamental pillars, sustainable transportation, energy savings in homes, buildings, and manufacturing, and renewable electricity generation. We, we do our work uh, guided by our, our five core questions. One, is this a high impact problem? You know, will this make a difference when we achieve our goals? And then, the, will will the EERE specific investment make a large difference relative to what the private sector is already planning on doing? And then, have we made sure to focus on the broad problem that we are trying to solve? And are we open to new ideas, approaches, and performers uh, to achieve that goal? And how will the ERE funding result in enduring economic benefit to the U.S.? Is it, is it part of a grounded long-term strategy? Is it a long-term opportunity for the country? And why is this specific thing that we're doing a proper high-impact role of the government versus something best left, potentially, to the private sector to address on its own? So these are the questions that our, our uh, directors ask every time before they create a new funding opportunity. And by asking these critical questions and making what we call the go no go decisions on continued EERE investments, it's clear in that the recent progress that we've had incredible recent progress uh, across all of our sectors. So just let me give you a, a couple of highlights in transportation in 2014 the five-year super truck program exceeded its goal of a 50% improvement in freight efficiency one year ahead of schedule uh, in long-haul trucking. Uh, and thanks in many regards, and also in transportation, thanks in many regards to DOE investments in electric drive technology, which is now, is now more widely available than ever before. And in fact, all the domestic manufacturers now feature a plug-in vehicle uh, either available today or in the near future that uses the, the technologies that we've supported in this area. Uh, also, I would, I would highlight that we now have three commercial cellulosic ethanol plants have come online that are their first, that are first of a kind plants and that were catalyzed by DOE support. Oops, I'm gonna go back. Yeah. In renewables, uh, in just the first four years of the 10-year SunShot initiative, we're nearly 70% of the way toward our reducing our, our goal towards uh, to reducing uh, solar PV costs. Uh, in, that's $2 a watt for uh, residential and $1 a watt for uh, commercial deployments. Uh, the cost of uh, US wind energy has decreased by more than a third in just the last five years alone. And the first tidal power plant in the U.S. was connected to the grid. In energy efficiency, as recently as 2012, replacing a standard incandescent with an LED equivalent might have cost around $50 per bulb. 
Today's LEDs are brighter, have better color quality, and, have, and many cost less than $10. With a life expectancy of over 10 years, these bulbs were already a solid investment, economic investment at $50 a bulb. And at $10 or less, they're just an absolute no-brainer. And according to our, our projections, by 2030, LED lighting will save Americans over $30 billion a year in electric costs just in this one technology alone. And finally, through our Better Buildings Challenge, more than 250 DOE partners are on track to achieve energy savings of 2.5% each year and have saved $300 million already due to less wasted energy since the challenge began. Let me talk a, a little bit about our, what, we, what we consider our return on investment. Uh, we strive to ensure that every project and initiative we invest in has the opportunity for a healthy return on investment for the taxpayer dollars invested. For example, over a 30-year period, EERE-funded combustion R&D on heavy-duty trucking efficiency resulted in a net benefit of more than $70 billion. That's a 70 to 1 return on investment, an ROI that any company would envy. And as we can see through these statistics, these technologies are ready for deployment now and represent a huge near-term economic opportunity. According to a new recent report by Bloomberg, $310 billion was invested globally in clean energy last year, a growing market that's already creating businesses and supporting jobs through the research, development, and deployment of the clean energy technologies. At DOE, we believe that we should continue the necessary and appropriate investments to ensure that clean energy technologies today and tomorrow are not only invented but manufactured here in America in order to maximize the economic return for our, on, our ongoing R&D efforts. Here's a, a, give you a sense of the EERE budget trends. Uh, we've seen, in general, uh, a steady incline uh, on our budgets over the past 10 years, mostly coming off of a significant investment made in 2009 uh, through the Recovery Act. Uh, since then, we've held mostly flat and with some moderate increases uh, due thanks, to, thanks to, to, to pretty steady congressional support and I think a, a good recognition that uh, we've, we've, uh, in fact, uh, we've invested effectively in a suite of uh, really beneficial technologies. So moving on to our 2016 budget. The 2016 budget reflects the American, the administration's strong commitment to clean energy with increases across all our sectors. We're requesting $2.722 billion towards achieving our mission to create a sustainable uh, American leadership in the transition to a global clean energy economy. In the interest of time, I'll highlight just a couple of points from each of our technology offices, and, and there's more information in the slide deck itself, and I'm happy to uh, address anything in the Q&A at the end. And uh, Derek Ramos here of uh, EERE Congressional Affairs is also happy, uh, happy to help uh, get any questions answered if you have more specific things that I don't have the answer to. Um, so let me uh, go on to, to vehicles. Um, this is the, uh, the vehicle technologies uh, subprogram, uh, which includes three, uh, sorry, the vehicle technologies program includes three subprograms. One, uh, there's uh, uh, vehicle technologies itself. Um, there is, uh, let me make sure that these are all separated out. I, I guess we do have separate slides for all of them. So let me just start with the vehicles program. In 2014, we reduced the production of, uh, the production cost of electric drive vehicle batteries by 40% from the 2012 baseline cost. According to uh, our recently re released report, Revolution Now, some private sector ana analysts say there is a relatively clear technology path to $200 a kilowatt hour by 20 2020, which is another 50% reduction. And DOE's goal takes that further to $125 per kilowatt hour by 2022. At that point, ownership costs for 240-mile electric vehicles would be equal to that of any standard vehicle today. We also completed a successful R&D and demonstration of a four-cylinder clean diesel engine for a full-size pickup with fuel economy standards of uh, uh, standard improvement of 40%, achieving an additional 7 to 10 miles per gallon on average uh, in savings. And, or, 
in, in distance, I guess, and, com and complying with all the new uh, emission standards. Uh, the $440 million proposed vehicle budget would help EERE continue uh, and advance these successes. Uh, two, two points to uh, raise here are the EV Everywhere program at about $250 million, which is a DOE-wide initiative that works to prepare the U.S. to produce a wide variety of plug-in electric vehicles and with, with the goal of them being just as affordable and convenient and, frankly, more fun than gas power vehicles by 2022. Uh, and, uh, super, and our Super Truck 2 initiative, uh, building on the success of our, of our Super Truck initiative to reduce long haul um, or improve long haul uh, freight efficiency, um, this will, will begin, will try to leverage those successes into the rest of the heavy and uh, medium duty fleet. So bioenergy technologies, the second pillar of sustainable transportation, uh, develops cost-effective technologies that, that are uh, a key part of reducing our dependence on imported petroleum and substituting those with domestically produced non-food biomass resources. Uh, by 2030, the U.S. could produce more than 1 billion tons of sustainable biomass resources, according to our analysis, which that can fuel cars, trucks, and jets, and make chemicals. And, and including producing power, all of which lead, could lead to a 30% decrease in our current petroleum usage. And that's not including uh, the fuels from algae. Uh, and this is why ERE has invested in this emerging industry and, and has successfully reduced the cost of converting feedstocks to biofuels. The $246 million bioenergy budget has, has uh, an, a number of priorities you can see here. One, I, one I'd like to highlight is our transition into investing in feedstocks uh, in order to uh, develop and validate technologies to help meet this, um, this cost target, uh, the, the 2017 biomass feedstock cost target, which is a, still a significant portion of uh, the cost that we need to knock off um, and to pursue, uh, pursue new research in advanced feedstocks and develop pathways, new conversion pathways for those feedstocks. Uh, fuel cells uh, develops technologies to enable fuel cells to be cost competitive in a, diversa, in a diversity of applications, especially light duty vehicles, but also including uh, uh, other, other modes and to enable uh, renewable hydrogen to be cost competitive with gasoline. We've had a, a great deal of success in reducing the manufacturing cost of automotive fuel cells. Uh, to now $55 per kilowatt in 2014, more than a 50% reduction just since 2006. And uh, with a budget of about 103 million, EERE would invest in reducing the in continuing to reduce these costs and increase the durability of fuel cells and advanced technologies to reduce uh, the hydrogen production, delivery, and storage costs as well as invest in uh, grid modernization projects to enable uh, this production. Now in renewable power, um, the first of the renewable uh, power technologies I'll talk about is a solar energy office, uh, which we uh, have under the, the SunShot initiative banner. A um, couple of uh, successes in this area. The, uh, one highlighted by the Sunshot Incubator, which uh, since 2007 has provided early stage assistance to small businesses and brought in new products and services to the marketplace, leveraging about a $100 million investment, uh, resulting in about $2 billion in subsequent private uh, sector funding. The budget there of $336 million would support uh, the solar program's goals by investing in uh, best-in-class solar power, um, concentrating solar power innovations at the 1 to 10 megawatt scale, uh, focused in, in, on uh, soft costs in, for commercial scale and uh, residential scale PV. These soft costs, such as permitting and financing costs, are an increasingly higher percentage of the overall cost of solar. In fact, since uh, the beginning of 2010, the average cost of solar PV panels has dropped more than 60%. And the cost of the overall PV system has dropped by 50% over the last three years alone. However, the installed cost of, of, of solar in Germany, 
with its much lower uh, solar radiation than, than here is, is less than half the cost of insoling, installing solar in California, which shows just the level of improvement we still have to make in that area. And so if we can decrease those non-hardware hardware soft costs, um, we can uh, make, make these technologies available to a, much more of the country. In wind energy, uh, we work to establish, uh, we're working to establish uh, a competitive U.S. offshore wind industry uh, through cost reductions uh, focused on technology R&D, uh, demonstrations, and elimination of, uh, and reduction of uh, market barriers, as well as enabling the seamless and cost-effective integration of wind power into the grid. Um, wind deployment has grown rapidly in the past few years. In 2013, the total cumulative U.S. wind installed capacity was approximately 65 gigawatts, or 4.5% of total U.S. consumption. Uh, and with roughly 80% of U.S. electricity demand coming from the coastal stage, states, offshore wind is a, cru a crucial resource and a huge opportunity for the country to add to our clean energy mix. Uh, to that end, the ERE has picked three offshore wind technology demonstration projects that are in their, the mid-stages of development in uh, Virginia, New Jersey, and Oregon to develop offshore wind systems that we uh, intend to be ready for commercial operation by the end of 2017. The budget of $145 million will help ensure this project is completed as well as supporting innovative wind turbine R&D, both for onshore and offshore, and identify performance barriers and adapt solutions to improving the cost and performance of utility-scale wind plants. Uh, in water power, uh, water power works to tap into the power of the ocean's waves and tides while supporting research and innovative technologies capable of generating renewable, environmentally responsible, and cost-effective electricity from the U.S. Uh, water resources uh, across the country. Uh, our assessment of wave and tidal energy resources show that the potential exists to generate one, one point, uh, I guess it's <laughs> 1,420 terawatt hours, because I don't know what the next one is up from terawatt, uh, of electricity each year off the U.S. coast. Um, a budget of $67 million uh, for this program allows for the design and front-end engineering of full-scale grid-connected open water wave test facility to help unlock this potential. This facility would be capable of testing and demonstrating wave power converter components and systems under operating conditions, uh, which is a key uh, component to allowing this industry to develop in the United States. Uh, hydropower at, 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 at dams is a proven renewable resource and it provides the largest share of U.S. renewable energy generation currently. And that's why in this budget, we would also include the initiation of Hydro Next, a sub-program to develop low-cost modular technologies for hydroelectric generation at non-powered dams today. Geothermal technologies supports research and development and innovative technologies that reduce and risk the costs of bringing geothermal power online in partnership with industry, academia, and DOE's national laboratories. So uh, the exciting uh, place here is that the next generation advances in subsurface technologies, such as fracking that, that people are aware of, uh, and, high, and horizontal drilling technologies will enable access to more than 100 gigawatts of clean, renewable geothermal energy. And we've already had a few successes here. Uh, ORMAT Technologies leveraged DOE funding to demonstrate the nation's first enhanced uh, geothermal system project to supply uh, electricity to the grid, generating an additional 1.7 megawatts of power at its Desert Peak site. Uh, this, is, this is upgrading an existing uh, geothermal uh, site using the, the latest technology. And Baker Hughes completed a preliminary design for a measurement while drilling system for geothermal applications capable of operation at 300 degrees Celsius for 50 hours and at depths of up to 30,000 feet and complete with a mud pulse telemetry system. Don't ask me what that is. Um, a, a budget of, of $96 million would enable this uh, geothermal technology office to invest in this subsurface technology and engineering R&D, specifically with the 
Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, FORGE, um, which uh, th this budget would help uh, geo geothermal technologies launch and implement phase three of the FORGE initiative to advance to a, uh, a site down selection uh, for and to begin field operations. Now, in the energy savings uh, pillar, first buildings. Uh, we know that our homes and buildings cost the country more than $430 billion a year to power, and they consume more than 73% of the nation's electricity, contribute, uh, and contribute to 40% of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions. So we're leading the way to continually develop cost-effective energy-saving solutions that make our country run better through increased energy conservation and efficiency. For example, 450,000 homes have been upgraded through the Better Buildings Residential Program and Home Performance with Energy Star Program. This has led to up to 25% savings on energy bills across 43 states. With a budget of $264 million, BTO will develop and promote technologies and practices that, when fully deployed, would reduce U.S. building-related energy use by 50% by 2040, saving roughly $200 billion for consumers and businesses. Advanced manufacturing. Uh, the, global man, the global landscape here is, is, is changing in ways that, that the companies must engineer and manufacture new products. The pace of innovation is faster, and product development cycle times are getting shorter and shorter. Yesterday, the premium was on cost. Today, it's really on innovation. So to, in order to get, gain a sustainable competitive advantage in the United States, we need to invest much more in innovation, to take more risks and have the right talent to carry technology forward. Within EERE's energy efficiency portfolio, the Advanced Manufacturing Office, or AMO, focuses on, targeted technology, on a targeted technology portfolio that accelerates research, development, demonstration, and deployment of emerging technologies to increase, both increase energy efficiency and productivity and the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing in global markets. AO, AMO was directly involved in establishing the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, or NNMIs, and the Institute for Advanced Composite Manufacturing Innovation, which was stood up this year, uh, made up of more than 100 industry and academic partners and members. In its first year of operation, Critical Materials Institute researchers have already filed seven patent disclosures. Led by Ames Laboratories in Iowa, the CMI is a five-year investment of up to $120 million and serves as the nation's premier research and development and deployment institution for critical materials, their alloys, and their oxides. In fiscal year 2016, ERE's budget request of $404 million continues to support R&D facilities where industry and research institutions con conduct shared pre-commercial R&D on high-impact, cross-cutting, advanced manufacturing innovations to advance their readiness towards domestic commercial production. For example, up to six new individual competitive funding opportunities of approximately $20 million each that will be released in AMO priority foundational manufacturing technology thrust areas. The full funding of two new clean energy manufacturing innovation institutes that will also provide annual support for existing facilities, including four institutes, one energy innovation hub, and one manufacturing demonstration facility. And the technologies that enable American manufacturers to use the critical materials more efficiently and reduce or eliminate the need for materials that are subject to display, supply disruptions. Almost there. The Federal Energy Management Program is also in the energy efficiency pillar. Uh, as America's largest energy consumer, the federal government must lead by example. The Federal Energy Management Program's $43 million budget request will enable federal agencies to meet energy-related and other sustainability goals and to provide energy, federal energy leadership by leading by example. One of the mechanisms we're using uh, is in, in, we used in uh, fiscal year 2014 uh, through a competitive grant process, the Federal Energy Efficiency Fund, or FEEF, awarded $5 million to nine different energy projects within the government, many of which are first-time implementations of, of these technologies that ha have 
been valued with a total investment of $120 million. So there's a high degree of leverage in these funds. Uh, weatherization. Since uh, the Weatherization and Intergovernmental Program, the, or WIP, since this program began in 1976, it has helped improve the lives of more than 7 million families by reducing their energy bills. WIP works with state and local organizations to speed up the deployment of clean energy technologies and practices by a wide variety of government, community, and business stakeholders. A couple of successes to highlight here. WIP exceeded its 2014 performance goal of 24,600 home retrofits for low income families by 50% through the Weatherization Assistance Formula Grants Program. And WIP successfully recruited 15 to 20 private sector partners for our Better Buildings initiatives, which help uh, spread at no cost to the, to the government our, our technologies and best practices uh, across the country. The budget request of $218 million will help WIP award and manage its weatherization assistance formula grants and provide weatherization retrofits for approximately 33,000 low-income families across the country. It'll also uh, allow us to provide competitive grants for weatherization assistance in the underserved multifamily sector and award and manage uh, 56 formula grants to help state governments expand energy efficiency and renewable energy policies and technologies. This is. Finally, our, our, our mission critical uh, cross-cutting support programs. First is strategic programs uh, with a request of $27.8 million to increase the overall effectiveness and impact of all of EERE's technical programs. Specifically, strategic programs launched LabCorp this year, uh, which trains and empowers DOE's national laboratories to accelerate the commercialization of clean energy innovations and increase their impact. We also launched the National Incubator Initiative for Clean Energy, my favorite acronym, NICE, which provides critical support to bringing startups closer to the market readiness. NICE will create a national network uh, support to support and serve the clean energy small business and entrepreneur community. Uh, across DOE, there are, cross -cut, there are these uh, cross-cutting initiatives. I'll mention a few that are key to EERE's uh, portfolio. Um, EERE is focused on, enduring, on ensuring the success of American, the American manufacturing sector, and therefore each program office contributed to a cross-cutting clean energy manufacturing, manufacturing initiative, or CME. And in, and in addition, uh, in order to maximize the contributions of all EERE technologies to a reliable and secure electrical grid, EERE has undertaken a comprehensive grid modernization initiative with partnership across the DOE and our national labs to develop technical tools as well as design as the design and testing of integrated energy ecosystems to help realize the full potential of the opportunities of a modern grid. So let me just, let me just close um, by saying that the, the sustainability and security of the U.S. energy resources, we believe, are the defining issue of our time and an, and an immediate and urgent issue for us to address. The, the Obama administration continues to show strong support for energy efficiency and renewable energy activities through these increased budget requests and a strong support of policies that were, will lead to long-term clean energy solutions to help meet our nation's energy demands. It is clear that EERE will be a critical player in, in America's energy future and in our continued competitiveness in this growing uh, clean energy technology race across the globe. So in sum, there's a lot at stake, and we feel like we have a lot of work yet to do but we are on the cusp of, of really achieving something great. Uh, the clean energy revolution is real and it is happening, and we believe it's up to all of us to keep that momentum going. Thanks for your time, and I'm happy to talk at the end. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. Obviously, there was a ton of information there, and hopefully you'll be able to 
uh, formulate some, some questions, and it's really worth delving into because there is so much interesting uh, programmatic information here. Uh, I want to recognize uh, one of our um, uh, partners with regard to this briefing. As I mentioned at the outset, that uh, we've been holding these budget briefings every year for a lot of years uh, in, in conjunction uh, with the House uh, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Coalition. And many times either the one of the one or both of the co-chairs or the staff will uh, be able to be here as, as part of that. The House Coalition is chaired by is co-chaired by Congressman Reichert of Washington State and by Congressman Van Hollen of Maryland. And Robert Beesman, who is with Congressman Reichert, is here. And um, on behalf of the uh, of behalf of the caucus, uh, you could say a few words. We would welcome you. That would be terrific. And it's a good chance to recruit new members. Hey everyone, my name is Robert Beesman. I'm with Congressman Reichert. Hopefully, our speakers aren't putting you to sleep yet. Um, but I uh, just want to thank e ESI um, for providing speakers uh, for this briefing and, and for the speakers for taking time to uh, talk about the importance of renewables. Um, if uh, your bosses have any interest in joining the caucus, feel free to reach out to me um, at extension 57761. Um, we'd love to have you join the caucus, or if you have any ideas about renewables, we'd love to hear it. So thank you for coming. being here. And so now we will turn to um, our speaker, Fred Sassine, from the Congressional Research Service for his take and kind of an overview analysis of, of uh, looking at the EERE budget. Fred? Do you want to come up here? Well, uh, can I do it from here just for the sure. beginning? That's and fine. then I'll move over to the podium. Uh, as most of you know, CRS is required by law to be non-biased and non-partisan. So before my remarks on the budget, I must make a formal disclaimer. Well, the truth is, I'm not really Fred from CRS, and my colleague is not really Scott from Stella Corporation. Surprise, we're actually Dusty and Billy from the rock music band ZZ Top. Yes, it might be hard to recognize us without our electric guitars, but maybe this will help. Uh oh, if you're going to electrocute me, Fred, I don't want to do this. Oh my God, look at you. Un unbelievable. Okay, 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 okay. Twang. Twang, there we go. So now you Does this give us. you uh, confidence in CRS? I just want to know that. <laughs> no bias, no partisan. Well, that you'll find out. I try to get Michael to his So as you can see, in reality, I, I cut off my beard to conceal my true identity from CRS. But Scott is another story. Like Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, Scott loves his rock star persona. And as captain of his own company, there was no pressure for him to hide his identity. Well, I guess all these years in government caused my sense of humor to dry up, since I'm not getting much laughs here. <clears throat> and you can obviously see why I gave up on careers in music and in comedy. Instead, I chose a much more exciting career to work for Congress. Okay, let's get on with the rest of the CRS fact-checking. Putting my policy face back on. Everyone should have a hard copy of the slides in the presentation. Uh, if you don't, this will all be on the website later. Um, I will refer to the slides by number, which is shown in the bottom right-hand corner of each slide. Also note that some slides are shown with a dark blue background. Those are a little different. They're index slides, each of which lists a group of slides that follow immediately after it, just to help you kind of guide through. So let's start with slide two, entitled Outline, 
which provides an ordered list of the blue index slides that can help you quickly find different sections of the presentation if you're just looking for pieces of it. So I'm just going to motor through these. I'm not going to go through all the details, plus really Mike's already done that. So uh, my job, my task was just to hit highlights and show you where the main changes are in funding. Uh, for example, slide three, a blue index slide, identifies the five slides in the overview section. Slide four on highlights shows that the proposed $809 million increase for EERE accounts for about one-third of the total DOE increase of about $2.5 billion. Slide five lists the administration's goals for cutting oil imports and for advancing U.S. leadership in the global markets for clean energy. Unless specified otherwise, I believe these goals are stated relative to a 2010 baseline. Slide six shows the key national interests addressed by EERE's clean energy focus, namely international competitiveness, climate change, and oil imports. Slide seven stresses that the budget comparisons employ FY16 and FY15 differences, and notes that most figures are rounded off for simplicity. Slide eight describes the four functional groupings or themes of major program areas that DOE uses to organize its account lines. The four themes are sustainable transportation, renewable electricity, energy efficiency, and corporate management. Slide nine, a blue slide, outlines the section on funding changes by each of the four themes. Slide 10 shows that DOE's sustainable transportation theme brings together the vehicles, bioenergy, and hydrogen programs with a combined increase of $191 million. Slide 11 lays out the $189 million increase for the rest of the renewable energy programs, which are focused on electric power production. Water power is not included in my slides due to the small increase. Slide 12 covers the major changes for the rest of the energy efficiency programs for which DOE seeks an increase of $388 million. Slide 13 lists the changes for corporate management and in-house activities which cover facilities, program direction, and strategic programs. Slides 14 through 16 describe the major funding changes for specific programs. This is where you might want to drill down a little bit and help you get to whatever the most interesting programs are for you or for your office. Uh, note that manufacturing and vehicles would get the largest dollar share of the increases. Slide 17 introduces the next section, which provides, a more, provides more details about specific programs. The program slides cover both goals and funding. Slide 18 shows the goals and funding increases for the manufacturing program. The main increase is sought for advanced manufacturing facilities. Also, a sizable increase is sought for manufacturing R&D projects. Slide 19 breaks down the increase for the facilities portion. Uh, the larger share is slated for two new clean energy manufacturing institutes. DOE says those institutes support the president's national network of manufacturing innovation. Slide 20 identifies components of the increase requested for the R&D projects. Slide 21 notes that for the vehicles program, the main priority is for plug-in electric vehicles to achieve parity with conventional cars. The largest funding increase is for battery and electric drive technologies. Smaller but still hefty increases are sought for outreach and deployment, materials technology, and fuels and lubricants. Slide 22 provides some details about the increases for those four vehicle te uh, technology subprograms. Slide 23 covers the goals and increases for the solar program. The main goal is power cost parity by 2020. Slide 24 breaks down the increase sought for buildings energy efficiency. The largest increase for emerging technologies would focus on computer technology, grid integration, and new technologies for air conditioning and refrigeration. Increases are also sought for residential buildings, appliance efficiency standards, and building codes. 
Slides 25 and 26 present goals and activities of the geothermal program. Um, slide 25 shows the cost reduction and capacity development goals for the hydrothermal subprogram. The main focus is on sensing and drilling technologies to target and develop what DOE calls blind resource areas. These resources are mainly in the Western United States. Slide 26 describes the long-term goals of the Enhanced Geothermal Systems, or EGS. An MIT study from a few years back suggests that at a depth of about six miles, there should be usable and a much larger resource nationwide, not just in the Western states. The focus there is on adapting technology that has parallels to oil and gas fracking technology, but perhaps with even greater technical barriers. Slide 27 covers wind energy. Energy production cost targets are cited for both land-based and offshore wind equipment. Previous support for offshore wind farm demonstrations is underway. This request seeks additional funding for technology initiatives, including rotors, drivetrains, and public-private partnerships. An increase to address market barriers would focus on offshore wind permitting, environmental impacts, and grid integration. But for this year's request, the main focus of that subprogram is on environmental impact mitigation for eagles and for other wildlife. Slide 28 on bioenergy shows goals for drop-in fuels and for algae biofuels. Funding would increase slightly for biorefinery pilot projects and to raise the yield for the algae feedstocks. Slide 29 on grant programs describes increases sought for weatherization and state energy grant programs. Also funding is sought to support a new local government grant program. DOE proposed something like this last year. I don't believe it got any funding. It was a smaller amount then and it was combined with um, something else having to do with other projects. Slide 30 notes that 25 million is sought for another year of the critical materials hub, which especially supports the manufacturing program. This would be the last year of that funding. For the building energy efficiency hub, another year of funding is not requested. However, there is a request for 10 million in competitive funding for small and medium sized commercial buildings, which was the focus of the uh, building's energy efficiency hub, uh, which has gone through uh, evolution, is now known as um, PSU. Okay, after slide 31, I've included some additional reference material. Um, this uh, will not show up in DOE's presentation, so it's uh, kind of my effort at value added. Uh, slide 32 on context provides some background on the innovation process and demonstration projects. The developmental gap between R&D and commercialization of technology poses some key financial risks for private companies. Demonstration projects try to help bridge that gap, but tend to be expensive and thus controversial in the budget process or I should say often controversial, but not necessarily always. Slide 33 introduces a section that puts energy efficiency R&D and renewables R&D funding in the historical context of spending for other DOE energy technology R&D programs. Slide 34 has a pie chart that shows a long-term view of the relative funding shares for the four main energy technology programs, nuclear, fossil, renewables, and efficiency. Slide 35 shows the relative shares of energy R&D funding for three different historical time periods. I get this question a lot um, in my office from staffers. Uh, the most frequent usually is the, you know, the last 10 years or so, but um, I've also given you some deeper historical perspective here, and you can see for the longest term, funding for nuclear and fossil clearly dominate. In the most recent period, there is a more even distribution. Slide 36 presents a table with the energy program funding breakdowns for the most recent two fiscal years, 14 and 15, and the request for FY16. Slide 37 takes that table and puts it into three pie charts. 
which give a visual picture of the relative shares of energy technology funding um, those two fiscal years and the new request. It does not show funding sizes, just the portions of the total for each of those fiscal years. Slide 38 identifies key national interests that shape the framework of issues, which in turn forms the structure for most energy policy debates. So any mix of all of these factors often come into things that you have to be concerned with when uh, this comes up to the floor for a vote. Slide 39 might be the mo most important one for the congressional staff. It lists some additional resources uh, at CRS that may be helpful to you when you work on these budget issues. Also, um, I have a report underway on EERE appropriations. It will look like this. This is the rough draft that I'm working on right now, which will soon be available for congressional staff. So that's all of my um, hardware uh, discussion. But finally, I, I need to make one more, one last CRS disclaimer, if you'll bear with me. Many of you know the famous American commentator, Will Rogers, or maybe you don't. <laughs> but he wants, yes. <laughs> Not by much. <laughs> when once asked about the extent of his knowledge on government policy, Rogers once famously remarked that all I know is what I read in the newspapers. I am today in a directly parallel situation because all I know is what I read in the DOE budget documents. So. If you have any difficult or tricky questions today about the EERE budget, <laughs> please direct them to DOE's presenter, Mike Carr, and not to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it's always so interesting in terms of looking at this kind of analysis and putting things in, into a context, into a historic uh, context, so that we can really look at, at how things have changed um, uh, over the years and as we really kind of look at the whole proportionality with regard to the energy budget. And, um, and, and besides, it's also really important to know that CRS really does have a sense of humor. Um, uh, I now like to turn to our third speaker, to Scott Sklar, who is the chair of the Sustainable Energy Coalition Steering Committee uh, and the president of the Stella Group and also uh, an adjunct at GW. Thank you. Um, I worked up here uh, for nine years in the U.S. Senate uh, in energy and military affairs in the 1970s, so I've been in this field a long time, and I started with AIR, just like all of you. Um, and I teach two interdisciplinary courses at GW um, on sustainable energy sponsored by the engineering school, the law school, the business school, and the science part of the arts and science school. I put on the table outside the 30 studies I require my students to be familiar with. And these studies, in aggregate, show that with technology we have today, uh, we can meet most or all of global energy needs, or U.S. energy needs, uh, with the portfolio of high-value energy efficiency and renewables sustainably. There are no peer-reviewed studies, by the way, on using traditional energy sources sustainably. So just a, just a thought. Um, I thought rather than nitpicking, which I've done for the last decade doing these, I would try a different tact with you to sort of end this up and keep it spunky. This is a chart that McKinsey and Company uh, put out on sort of the 12 disruptive technologies. And these are the technologies, frankly, that are going to drive our economics, all right? And so you can see uh, renewable energy. Uh, the traditional uh, oil and, and gas fracking technology, advanced materials, and by the way, why you can have 
and why Oak Ridge National Labs is so important in the portfolio is some of the greatest successes in photovoltaics, offshore wind, marine technologies, LED, solid state lighting, and, and energy storage is because of the material, advanced material science renaissance we are going through right this second. None of this could happen without this disruptive technology coming along at the same time. 3D printing, many of the components that you see in advanced renewable systems and telecom systems are made through 3D printing technologies. This is astounding. Energy storage, we are in a battery renaissance for my business where I blend all this energy efficiency and renewable energy in the private sector globally. Um, energy storage, I work with 60 different kinds of battery materials from over 100 companies. Not only are the materials are becoming more diverse and lower cost, uh, they are lasting longer. And so what appeared to be, and what I'm doing with the military on thin film batteries is just beyond science fiction uh, that I can uh, ever report here without getting jailed. Um, mobile internet and all of the information technologies, cloud technologies, you know, you think of that in computing, but it's in fact we're using them for smart information systems on energy loads, uh, with energy bills, with distributed generation with energy efficiency, with smart thermostats. Apple didn't spend a few, uh, sorry, Google didn't spend a few billion dollars for the Nest thermostat uh, because they thought it was cute. They are planning to go into linking information and buildings and behavior together. Uh, so this blend of disruptive technologies is what's going to drive not only the U.S. economy, but the energy economy as well. Um, this is where we're going, although with fits and starts, because the traditional utility industry obviously doesn't want to change, as the traditional telephone industry wanted to stop cellular and whine that the, it would never be profitable. Uh, well, here's the same thing that's happening, is we're going to take, we're moving from central station dumb power plants uh, with transmission distribution lines to the load to central station smarter plants with energy storage, combined heat and power system, renewables, and smart web-enabled uh, efficiency and load reduction. And that is the self-healing grid of the future. It will be more economic. It will be more reliable. It will be cleaner. It will use less water. By the way, energy from cradle to grave uses more water in the United States than does growing food. So if you are concerned about the water crisis, you damn well better change from central station dumb power plants. There's no way around it. So, uh, so I want to put the renewable part in the context is that we have a $29.9 billion proposed budget for DOE, and all we are talking about is the very thing on the bottom is a $2.7 billion dollar budget for the blended efficiency renewable. So it's less than 10 percent of the budget. When I come up here and talk to members and staff, somehow that's all forgotten. Well, this is the teeny part of the budget. It's the most dynamic as well. Um, the other issue I think that's good, and I'm not going to whine about it, this is one of the first budgets I've seen where they didn't try to throw a couple of technologies overboard. I think the only other time I've seen it uh, in what I call the modern context, is the last year, last term of the Bush one administration, where they did the same thing. Normally, how both sides of the aisle do this, so I'm not throwing any, pointing any figures, they decide, oh, we're going to show we're cost cutting, so we're going to create a fake a rationalization to why to throw some technology overboard to show we're cost cutting. And in this case, they didn't do it. Uh, again, Bush one did the same thing, did, uh, followed a similar situation the last, uh, their last two years. So this, this, is a, this is a good thing. It's a smart way to, to deal with it. Uh, when I started in this field in the 1970s, um, there was about $300 million worth of investment in renewables 
most of that in hydro. And, uh, I, you know, I, I am happy to tell you, this is the Bloomberg chart, but 2014, it was $310 billion of private sector investment, about over a trillion dollars in uh, government investment. So these are growing. It's not going to stop. It's going to be a significant part of the market. So the R&D that we were so worried about in the 70s and 80s as the aftermath of the oil embargo is actually in the marketplace and the private sector is leveraging it just as the traditional energy sector is leveraging it. This just came out of the International Energy Agency. I hate charts like this, but it was colorful and I sort of liked it for that reason. But if you look at the uh, second to the right, that gray set of bubbles, which is sort of the traditional energy stuff, that's the, where its cost is. And you can see all these other technologies, biomass, geothermal, hydro, actually below the bottom of those uh, traditional energy bubbles because their costs are getting better. And I want to point out something. Not only are they getting lower, but, you know, I hear this intermittency or variability stuff all the time. Well, biomass, geothermal, and hydropower, and actually concentrated solar power, are all 24-hour power. So the whole idea that renewables are variable is nonsense. The three out of the five are not variable at all. They're as actually reliable. We'll get to that capacity factors in a second. And you can see uh, wind, uh, par parts of wind are obviously below uh, those bubbles, and solar photovoltaics is moving to parity. So the whole issue, the whole point is we're oozing into competitiveness, and that's good. That's what we want. Um, this just came out of the International Renewable Energy Agency, which is part of the United Nations, IRENA. And these are global jobs in these technologies, $6.5 billion in 2013. Uh, now, the reason solar photovoltaics, I get asked this question all the time, have more jobs, is actually they have less jobs per megawatt in manufacturing, because manufacturing is automated, uh, but you have to install this stuff. You know, so and it's distributed. So you have a lot more on the on the on the delivery end than you do with a lot of the more central station. But these blended industries, you know, solar photovoltaics, the liquid biofuels, wind power, biomass, electricity and thermal, solar heating and cooling, uh, biomass, geothermal, small hydropower, and concentrated solar power, which is the desert stuff with the concentrators, again with storage. Uh, these are uh, creating global jobs. Huge jump. Huge jump. So um, that, that's a good news. And also in this country, uh, Solar Foundation puts out its yearly census. And so uh, they just put out release theirs. Again, I don't have it as a slide, but the solar industry in the United States produce, uh, actually has more jobs than the U.S. coal industry. Um, so I wanted to sort of put you through just a little retrospection. I can do it because I'm, as my daughter says, ancient. And I just want to say that this renewable energy efficiency stuff is thought of as an Obama thing. It couldn't be further from the truth. And so I put, since we're, I'm in the U.S. Senate, now majority party is Republican, I just went through and, said, and looked through my files on the leading legislation on renewable energy and energy efficiency in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And these are the lead senators who drove a lot of these bills. So Carl Curtis in Nebraska for biofuels, my old boss Jacob Javits. you think he was a New York senator, but cheese and dairy, big issue in New York, a lot of waste products. He did it because of water pollution, because of that, to, to, to intercept agricultural residue and turn it into fuels and electricity and uh, fertilizer uh, makes a lot of economic sense. And David Durenberger from Minnesota. Energy efficiency, Chuck Percy out of Illinois, and in fact, was, the, I think, the first senator to, to be the nonprofit head of the Alliance to Save Energy, the honorary chairman. Mark Hadfield of Oregon. Uh, national security, Richard Luger from Indiana. Jim Woolsey, former CIA director, not a senator, 
but Republican, very, very active today in this field. Uh, renewable energy, John Chafee, Rhode Island. Pete Domenici, New Mexico. And so, and then on tax credits, Bill Roth from Delaware, who was chairman of the tax committee. Most of the tax stuff we have today in renewables and efficiency came out of his brain and made sure it happened. And then Bob Packwood, Oregon. The point being is this has been bipartisan for a long time. And I want to point out that the Energy Policy Act of 75 and creation of 77 one, and every omnibus energy bill right up to the present has been passed by huge majorities of both parties. The idea that there is a black and white world between the parties on energy actually really isn't true. It's more of a media thing than it is a reality thing. Uh, uh, some couple of personal insights that I want to leave you today is that energy policy has always been driven in the modern context by a strategic focus on portfolio, options in energy. You never want to be stuck with one resource or one technology. I spent a lot of time in my courses focusing on risk. It's very depressing. They learn about terrorism. They learn about water shortages. They learn about squirrels bringing down the grid. It's really depressing. Uh, but the fact of the matter is what members of Congress have done, and virtually every of the last five modern presidents, they have been looking at portfolio theory. You want to blend in fuels and electricity and heat. And that's really what the game is. That's what this budget's all about and has really been followed pretty much to a T uh, from uh, Bush two, uh, Clinton, uh, Bush one, Clinton, Bush two, uh, and Obama. Uh, regarding risks, uh, we have a lot of risks, and they have nothing to do uh, in, in, with each other in many cases. We have a terrorism risk, we have a cybersecurity risks that are real, we have intense weather patterns, we have human error, which has brought down the grid more than any other thing. We have geological events, earthquakes, tsunamis, obviously climate, flooding, forest fires. Uh, so the issue is we need a resilient energy system in fuels and electricity. And we need a resilient energy system that doesn't hemorrhage every time something happens. I was hired by Governor Barber after Katrina and the Clinton Foundation New Orleans, uh, also after Katrina, because the infrastructure was ripped apart. Well, we can't just build up everything and assume everything is just, you know, keeping the same approach. We need more resilient self-healing grids like the internet. So we need fuels and systems that are closer to end users more in proximity to end users, like cell towers are in communications. We need more smarter grids, as well as smarter on-site generation. And we need uh, market and policy rewards for predictability. Why I am hired by Fortune 100 companies around the world to bring in efficiency renewables blended into their corporate operations, I'm telling you, it's not because of the beard. I am brought in because the technology blend that they want is their biggest concern is predictability, not lowest cost. Lowest cost is great at the moment, but then it flips. If you've ever seen the cost charts, which I won't bore you with, it goes up and down like this. They want predictability. They want to know Five years and 10 years from now, their energy is pretty much flat so they can worry about other things. That's what this is all about. So I just want to remind you that uh, there are no dumb questions. What's wonderful about having graduate students is the only kind of uh, job that is legalized slavery in the United States, which means if you have any questions uh, there are no dumb questions. I can get you research studies. I've already given you my 30 top reports list. There is tons of security and reliability studies right now uh, on all sorts and facets of energy. 
I am happy to share any of them with you as long as they're not, I'm, I'm allowed to do it. And so please feel free and not be shy because I'm just finding that we all have our own biases and ideas, but in fact, when you start looking at the broad blend of both technologies and research and, and, and analysis, you'll get a much fairer picture of what the options are. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. And I think once again, you know, as we think about all three of our, our presentations and our speakers today, is we think about the context of um, the issues, you know, as Fred was mentioning in terms of the, the um, framing issues and which, you know, which we saw um, in, in Mike's presentation as, as well. It's very, very clear how interconnected our world is in terms of all of the different sectors. And while the world becomes, it seems like, more complex at the same time, we are also seeing that it feels like there is this great race that is underway uh, in this country and also globally as um, more and more of these technology issues are really, really key to economic and international economic competitiveness in terms of our whole economies. And one of the things that I would also mention as we, uh, you know, talk to people uh, in terms of the, the private sector, in terms of other governments, what we hear over and over again is that policy matters, that uh, the private sector looks to government to help mitigate some of the risk because a lot of the R&D that they um, are looking for, they would not undertake themselves, and that therefore what we also see and what I have learned over the years is that there are so many partnerships between government and the private sector in terms of figuring out what makes sense in terms of R&D and, and then where that goes. Uh, so it's actually really, really fascinating. This is a great opportunity to really delve into these issues a little bit more and hear from, from our specialists here. So let's open it up for your, uh, for your questions. Uh, and if you could identify yourself, please, or comments. Okay, we'll go here first. Hi, Amy from the Cartwright office. For those offices that are getting ready for the appropriations process, obviously every office is gonna have their own priorities, but when we start getting pushback about cost, uh, increases, I'm curious if ERE or DOE like has kind of priorities or will have resources for knowing if there are certain programs that we should really be fighting for those increases. Um, something along those lines? Um, well, certainly on a, on a program by program basis, you know, I would encourage offices to reach out to, to Derek and, and uh, to talk about the particulars of each one of them. Um, I think actually Scott summarized it pretty well. There, there, there's actually two uh, main objectives here. And, and so um, one is, is maintaining uh, an important level of support to to keep increasing the tool chest here, the number of technologies that are available, uh, and so uh, baseline support for technologies even that might be a little bit longer term, uh, we think are are actually really a key to uh, keeping the pipeline going and, and developing these technologies. On 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 those specific topic areas where you see the big uh, increases in this year. Um, the reasoning really behind that is that the in, in you know sort of technology by technology, this is the opportunity to double down and to really leverage the competitive, the globally competitive opportunity in those in those technology spaces. Particularly, you know, manufacturing. I have to sort of say it again that we are in the midst of seeing onsourcing or onshoring uh, of, of these of uh, many of our manufacturing in, in this country, and this is the opportunity to 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 really kind of carve out that space within the clean energy uh, uh, technology race. Um, so I know that's not a direct, but, but we can definitely work with you on getting you specific answers if you, if you need them as, this, as it comes up. Um, and Derek, do you want to just stand up so that everybody knows? You individually based on your specific follow-ups. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, other questions or comments? Go ahead. Federal budget kind of gets uh, divided into separate silos and the like. Uh, thank you. Uh, question, uh, Mike, regarding the, the EPA budget for the Clean Power Act and uh, 111D, and, and to what extent can you share with us to uh, how your programs, your funding plays into, because uh, energy efficiency is obviously going to be a huge portion of how states meet the clean power rules. How does the, uh, how does the DOE budget uh, kind of play into what EPA is doing on clean power? Uh, okay. And so, um, I mean, I, I, again, I think I'd go back to what I was was just mentioning is you know, we view our role within the applied programs at DOE as expanding the, the tools available to solve these critical problems. Uh, efficiency, the building technologies office, you know, one specific aspect of it, but even beyond that in the, in the efficiency within uh, the manufacturing sector. Uh, I think we're, we're bringing new tools to bear, LEDs being one of the most obvious and most recent. We're seeing incredible uptake in that. And, and that gives you a whole solution space uh, to, uh, to meeting energy efficiency goals. Uh, we have the same kind of uh, opportunities we think in the pretty near future in vapor, you know, in getting away from vapor compression uh, air conditioners and into the next generation of air conditioners that are much more energy efficient. Just as an example, um, so you know the inter and and the interaction is can be direct. I mean, once we see what the opportunity space is, we obviously share with all of our federal partners. What, what that is, and then we then, and they will in, begin to incorporate it into their models uh, at, at the end of the day. Um, but it is, uh, you know, it is basically about sort of building out the opportunities uh, so that there's a lot of different compliance pathways, a lot of different ways to achieve the goals, and that, that are not region specific or, you know, that there's so that everybody uh, across the country sort of has the opportunity to get where they, where they want to get. Okay. Other questions? Sleepy group today. Sleepy. <laughs> um, okay. Over here. And why don't you just wait for the mic? Okay. Thanks. Uh, Alex Fields from the Center for American Progress. So, in the budget, it seems like a big part across the DOE is focusing on the grid modernization and the growth of the smart grid. And I was just wondering, especially now that there's a lot of and renewable energy sources are becoming more cost competitive the grid and approaching grid parity. What are the sort of the best strategies for implementing them and getting them integrated into the grid, as well as kind of developing solutions for demand response to ensure there's not overloads of the grid and that demand can be met? Um, uh, Scott might also have an opinion on this. I, 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 one one bit I would I would highlight is. Um, Particularly in the Recovery Act, but also in, you know in other in other uh, places, we we've, we've begun a pretty substantial investment across the country in 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 more intelligent grid. Uh, for, and but it is not yet interconnected, and we have not yet uh, taken advantage of all the opportunities that 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 more intelligent those more intelligent systems uh, provide. So uh, in our technology space, we're looking at what those opportunities are and trying to sort of think forward um, as, as we have smarter uh, appliances, we have smarter uh, solar inverters, we have you know, all, of, all of the parts of, of our value chain that we're generating um, will only have their value increased by, by ha being able to plug into a more intelligent, a more intelligent grid across, across the board. Um, those standards are still being worked out, and you know, and so it it is a sort of a it's a lumpy investment environment. We're going to invest in some things that you know you may not re realize that value for some number of years thereafter. But we we do per perceive that once you get to begin to integrate these things into a coherent system, you're going to have a much much higher value proposition than any of the technologies have alone. Uh, I just like to add um, there there are a couple of parallel paths you have to go. 
One, obviously, is to make the grid smarter. Actually, most utilities don't know they have outages until somebody actually calls them up, one of their ratepayers. So, uh, and it's a lot easier to reduce demand on a distribution line than run another line. In fact, I get called a lot of my, for my commercial industrial clients for energy efficiency because they have uh, overloaded distribution lines. And it's a lot faster and cheaper to just reduce the demand than build new generation or run new lines. So that's the good news. And so we need a smarter grid, and we need smarter and new appliances, and we need to track it. We need diagnostics and all that. But let us not say that that is a silver bullet. We also need what I call dumb generation. And that means, particularly for infrastructure, things that really matter, about 18% of our electricity. And that means, you know, you, do, you want to have, if there's a major outage, for whatever reason, again, terrorism, earthquake, forest fire, no matter how smart your grid is, it's down, that some of the critical functions in society, uh, cell towers, uh, pipeline pumps for fuels, water and sewage, uh, hospitals, things like that, uh, can run independently and can run continually. It means you don't have to rush around helicopters with fossil fuels costing $400 a gallon. Uh, and during Sandy, by the way, we had four, operating, uh, four hospitals shut down their operating rooms during operations and moving people around. That's beyond idiocy. idiocy. The diesel generators just didn't work or they couldn't get diesel to them. So we need a smart grid. We need what I call dedicated renewable energy generation. We need a lot more high-value energy efficiency. It needs to be all in parallel. You know, we've got to look at this like a mutual fund, not a blue-chip stock, and to make sure that we have this resilient energy system. And we need Congress and members of Congress and staffers sophisticated enough to understand that end game and not pick the flavor of the month. Um, Fred prompted me to make sure that I give my colleagues at the Office of Electricity within DOE their due as well. So they, you know, they work on the macro grid system and they are working on a lot of of uh, intelligent technologies. But um, and and that is one of the reasons that we have instituted in recent years this cross-cutting grid tech team to make sure that we integrate our products you know, that are coming out of our, our research uh, with an anticipation of how, how it's going to interact with that larger grid landscape that OE is working on as well. And if I can just add one more thing as well, there's a lot of move now towards community solar, community wind. There's a lot of move for microgrids, meaning at a university campus or a corporate campus or so an industrial park where you have an internalized grid. Not always AC, by the way. There's some very exciting work on also DC grids as well. But the point being is we have a lot of options, and we want to nurture those options. We're going to learn a lot from them. And so the whole point in this is as technology evolves, just as it has on your, your cell phone, that first was a dumb cell phone, and then became a cell phone, an MP3 player, and then became a cell phone, an MP3 player, and a web-enabled computer, and then add GPS and, and camera and everything else. That's really what's going to happen here, too, the same convergence of a lot of elegant blends of technology. And so we want to foster an environment that allows that to happen and not just stick uh, sort of unilateral which we have an inclination to do. Great. Uh, obviously, there are lots of issues in the budget, um, in the budget document, in terms of really looking at what the implications are, what a lot of the different kinds of technologies are, um, why they are being put forward um, in terms of in conjunction with the overall priorities being espoused by the administration. And, and so I hope that you will all look at this much more carefully and please feel free to contact any of us with regard to questions or Derek. Um, and uh, we will also have all the presentations posted on our EESI website. So please feel free to take advantage of that so that you can see the slides in 
large um, uh, living color. And uh, anyway, I want to thank you all for coming. And just to let you know, too, that next Monday we will be holding a briefing. Uh, the jobs, the solar jobs issue came up. We're going to be looking at that national census in terms of looking at where these jobs are, what kinds of jobs. Uh, that will be next Monday. And then we will be also looking at the uh, uh, buildings energy sector and some of the interesting, wonderful success stories coming out of that. Um, and we'll also be taking a look at offshore wind. So we have about 10 different briefings that are all kind of connected to uh, some of these areas that we've heard a little bit about today um, that will be coming up over the next uh, couple, two or three months. So thank you all very much for coming. Really, really appreciate all of you. It represents a lot of time and work, and we really, really appreciate it. Thanks.